my first full service flight in British Airways latest business class product, the club suite. And although I was sad to be going home, I was really looking forward to 14 hours in BA's upgraded business class product. Good food, good drink, and it's a night flight, so I'll tell you what the club suite is like for sleeping. And to pay for this trip, I used 100,000 points and I paid 550 pounds in fees and taxes. So if we value the Avios at 1p each, then this flight was about 775 pounds each way, or about 55 pounds an hour. But I messed up. I paid more cash than I needed to. And I explain how I bought the ticket and how you can save on fees and taxes towards the end of the video. Hi, I'm Phil and I'm on a grey gap year. I started out at the Holiday Inn on Nathan Road in Hong Kong and I used the MRT to get to Central and then there was a long walk uh, underground to Hong Kong Station and on to the Airport Express. I had a large suitcase with me and on the London Underground this would have meant I'd have to drag it up and down stairs but every station I used in Hong Kong had lifts or escalators and it was painless to get to the airport on public transport. Hi there. Hello. One for the airport please. One, one, five. Okay, I've got that. Card, please. The Airport Express has luggage racks for suitcases and carry-on bags, and it's fast and it's fairly regular, and I found it good value at 115 Hong Kong dollars, which is less than 12 pounds. A short walk or travelator trip up to the check-in queues. Well, as expected, the check-in desks are not open yet. So there's an economy world traveler queue. And then there's a World Traveller Plus queue. Can't see a club queue. So I guess I'll grab a seat. Some time later. There we go. That's better. So that's the luggage going to London. Gate 7, 1025 boarding and gate close to 1050. We have a window seat for you. Um, we're using Qantas Lounge, just not immigration shop right here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Immigration this way. Yeah, immigration on the front. You may have heard during that check-in that we were boarding at gate seven and we have access to the Qantas Lounge uh, with the ticket. So the Qantas Lounge is down there. And that's where we're almost the gate, so I'm gonna guess gate seven is not too far from where we are. Well, there's gate five and gate six. So no prizes for guessing where gate seven is. Um, but as a One World Emerald's got access to Cathay Pacific's first class lounges. And apparently the best of those two is the pier all the way at gate number 60. So that's where I'm off to. I've already made a video about my experience in the Cathay Pacific, the pier first class lounge. And I'll leave you a link to that in the description. The pier and gate seven couldn't be much further away from each other if you tried, but I took a leisurely stroll back towards the main entrance of the airport using the travelators. I plan to take a look around the other Cathay Pacific first class lounge, which is called The Wing. But as I got closer to the gate, it became clear that I just left it too late to stop in at the wing, and I still haven't been in the first class part of that lounge. Went past 26 and I thought, that's only 10 gates. This is going to be an awfully long way. Please mind your step. But 13 to 22 are off down there, so we're skipping those. Oh, yeah, I know I am now. This is where I went down for the train. Okay. <laughs> Gate six immediately. Your plane is going without you. Right, so that's an 11 o'clock departure, that is an absolute final call. And there they are. <laughs> They've been found. <laughs> oh, these are nice. Boarding was very orderly with well-marked queues, but I think the hat tip goes to Hong Kong Airport rather than BA. Hello. Well, How are you doing? Okay. okay. Yes, good, thank you. 23A? A nice welcome today. And a right turn for everyone through a new style first cabin that looked like it might have the sliding doors. Swanky. Then through the forward business cabin and through the galley into the middle business cabin and then onwards to the rear of the rear business cabin. 
So eight first class seats and then 76 club suites in a one two one configuration on this Boeing 777-300. And finally, I make it to seat 23A. And since I've had a sticky beak at first, I think I'll have a quick nose around premium economy and BA premium economy is on my to-do list. Looks pretty good. The business cabin on this aircraft is just huge. It's in one two one configuration and the center pairs have their feet pointing inwards towards the center. And then there's a privacy screen for solo travelers. On first glance at my seat, it looked absolutely spot on. I mean, throw the bedding into the overhead cabin, get settled in, grab a drink off the tray. Pre-departure beverage choice with champagne or orange juice. I took myself a little champagne. Hello. I'm going to tell you up front that the seat's good. I mean, I really like it. There's three little storage cubbies in the top of the suite. The first is sort of like a vanity cupboard uh, and with an amenity kit in it and a small mirror in the door. A larger bin with the universal plug, USB charger, headphone socket and the remote on a wire. And the USB charger actually had penny of juice in it. Uh, to go from 56% to full in an hour, well, that's about as fast as my Samsung S21 charges and then a smaller, slimmer cubby, which I just chucked my passport into. And during the flight, I found another storage area under the main unit, which is perfect for popping your shoes into. And I came across this built-in footrest, which is useful, I guess, if you're a bit taller than my five foot four inches. There's also an adjustable armrest. A lot of seats have this now, and it's a great feature. Lift it up when you're sitting, lower it down, and it makes a bit more space when you're sleeping. All in all, this is a really well thought out seat. The control panel that controls the seat uh, is within reach when you're seated and it's also accessible when you're standing putting the seat into bed mode. A simple panel with limited adjustments but it all worked really really well and it was easy to get comfy. The control panel also adjusts the over the shoulder light with three settings. There's another light in the ceiling but this is turned on and off with the main control that's situated in the storage bin and as you can see there's no personal air vents. There is, of course, a tray table, but again, it's really well thought out. A little latch to unleash it from under the in-flight entertainment screen, and then either leave it as a half table for drinks or snacks, or open it fully, and then there's another latch to release the slide so it slides towards you. And you can get out of the seat in both fully open or half open mode. And finally, it's tight to the IFE screen when it's stowed, so it isn't gonna smash your knees when you're in bed mode. We pushed back taxied to the runway and took off. We flew over the sea and into the inky blackness. So there's nothing to see here, but I did have a spectacular landing here a little while ago that really took me by surprise because we circled round Victoria Harbour. It was just stunning. And I'll leave a link in the description in case like me, well, that's your thing. Shortly after takeoff, we were offered a hot towel. The boiled rag. and a pre-dinner beverage with a packet of nuts served on a nice little tray. Now, if they could just serve those nuts in a bowl, I chose a vodka tonic. Cheers. And the snack mix was pretty good as well, you know. And that was the starting pistol for dinner. And when my meal came, it was served on a little tray under a big tablecloth. And I don't understand this choice when the competition always lay out the table and then serve each course. I can only imagine you need less crew to serve dinner like this, but it seems like a false economy to me. And now I've experienced Qatar Business Class and some others. Well, it just feels a bit cheap. When it came to choosing my starter, I picked the Gravelax over the soup. And what a choice that was. I mean, just look at that presentation. And I paired it with a nice, well-chilled Sauvignon Blanc. Cheers. I picked up the quinoa salad. I just, it just wasn't my thing. It just wasn't for me. The Gravelax though was one of the best starters I've ever had in the air. And it was salty and herby. The mustard dressing just took it up another level. Everything worked together beautifully. Even that pea puree, which I was a little bit suspicious of, but I loved every mouthful. I was served a trio of breads, again in a little basket, but they were stone cold, like out of the fridge cold. Uh, and this was the only thing that let the meal down. So let's move on to the main course. I was tempted by the halibut, but I'd had a fish starter, so I opted for the grilled beef fillet in Armagnac sauce. 
And again, it's well presented given the teeny tiny plate that it's served on with nicely turned potatoes and carrots. And turning veg is a skill I never really mastered when I worked in kitchens. So a little hat tip to the chef for those. Now it looks like I'm struggling to cut into the meat and I am a bit, but it's mostly because the knife that I've got rather than the meat, which is surprisingly good. And it's in a rich demi-glaze brandy sauce with great depth of flavor. And the sauce was just so good, I mopped it up with my bread. How uncouth, I know. But the sauce was just too good. And now a minor gripe about BA catering. Salt and pepper in little sachets wrapped with the cutlery. I can only imagine it's because everything's served on this little tray. But in club suite, they could lay the table nicely and have salt and pepper pots. I mean, they could, but they don't. And it's a pity. So dessert, it's gonna ruin this, right? BA couldn't possibly put three good courses together. Well, ladies and gentlemen, they did it. I picked the chocolate lava cake and it was good. Okay, so chocolate pudding is never gonna set the world of gastronome on fire, but it's a decent pud and I didn't need to resort to the cheese board on this flight. And I think in the absence of brandy, that's a Bailey's to go with my dessert. Cheers. So with dinner complete and cleared and the cabin lights still up, I ordered a Talisker 10 year old single malt whiskey and a very large measure was delivered. And to finish, of course, our whiskey. <laughs> the bog standard. BA loos are about the same size and style as the average economy toilet, so if they're clean, they only achieve bog standard status, they can be no more. And this BA toilet was no exception. It has a seat upon which you could sit to tie your shoes or perhaps putting on pyjamas. There's a changing table, some white company soaps that need topping up, but that really is about it. The little flower holder is a reminder of what could be without BA cost cutting. But does no flower change my flying habits? Well. I doubt it, and that really is what BA are counting on. But yeah, it's bog standard. Let's get the BA headphones out of the way. They're over here, which is good, but they're not noise cancelling, which has become really the de facto standard in business class. If I was an economy, premium economy, these would be gold standard, but in business, they're below the standard of almost all other carriers. I think my face just says it all. A neat feature though is the headphone socket in the larger storage cubby. Remember that from earlier? Well, the lid leaves a gap when it's closed so the headphones can be plugged in nearby without you catching your elbow on a chunky plug or ruining the aesthetic of the seat. And it works too if you're charging your phone from the USB. Very nice. The screen then, it's excellent in these new club suites. I think it's a good size, it's bright, responsive, decent resolution, either on par or perhaps above its competitors. The entertainment selection looks better on this 777 than it did on the 7879 that I had in the other direction. They both have a decent selection of movies, but I'm a box set guy, so I notice TV shows more than anything. And on this aircraft, there seems to be a bigger selection of TV shows and uh, more series with full seasons, but the pitiful first three episodes of a uh, season still exists. You could watch the first three episodes of Yellowstone season one, skip the rest of the season, and then watch the start of season two like an animal. I took three business flights with Qatar and I watched the entire season one of Tulsa King across those three flights. You can't do that with BA. But into the box sets that they do have, and it's a much better selection here on this aircraft. The complete season of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is where that boiled rag joke comes from, which I also seem to do every time I get a hot towel. Uh, five complete seasons of Big Bang Theory, The Suits, Young Sheldon. You can probably find something in this selection that's going to be to your taste. So I'd say this selection is above par, but it's not up there with Emirates or even Qatar Airways. I wasn't impressed with the bedding on the way over and it was the same bedding on the way back, a thin mattress topper, but a nice blanket to keep you warm in the roasting hot cabin that has no air vents. Nothing on the topper to attach it to the seat, but the easy to use controls are accessible from the aisle, even if you're a shorty like me. I think the foot cubby is good, but then I'm, as I say, five foot four. Let me know in the comments how you find this bed and the cubby for your feet. I thought it was really comfortable. So I popped the mattress topper on. Have I got that upside down? Let me know. I closed the door and I just got my head down. A note on the door and privacy. The walls and the door aren't particularly high and while you're offered decent privacy compared to non-suite products, it's not super private. But as I'm finding with BA, it's actually perfectly adequate. So I slept okay, but my pillow was a little bit lumpy. 
It's a very lumpy billow now. The leaves thrown away and started again. That is not a good billow at all. I know, right? A lumpy pillow, first world problems, but it is simple to remedy for very little cost. So let us march onwards to breakfast with a good dinner last night. Could breakfast be the last hurrah that tops off this really good flight? Well, the orange juice was a disappointing start. Not sure what that is. I mean, I know what it's supposed to be. I'll stick to the coffee, which for some reason isn't much better on BA. Then there was strawberry yoghurt, but it had been rather messily spooned into the bowl, and I needed to wipe it on the tablecloth, which was also laid upside down. My mum would be unimpressed. And once I got the bowl clean, I actually enjoyed it. It was a nice way to start the meal. Onto the fruit plate, nicely presented on a banana leaf, and I keep trying dragon fruit and watermelon to see if my palate's changed. It hasn't. But British Airways seems to consistently get the fruit course right, and this was a plate of nicely chilled, fresh tasting fruit. I picked the mushroom and cheese frittata for my main course, nicely presented, apart from a couple of misplaced beans that could and should have been tidied up before being served. It's very picky, I know, but this is business class, and it requires an eye for simple detail, like making sure the yoghurt isn't dribbled down the side of the bowl. Let me just tidy that up for you, BA. There you go, that's much better. With the plate cleaned up, the food was actually very good. Hot, tasty, well seasoned, a nice and satisfying breakfast. So to the finale, that is the croissant. Will it be cold? Will it be cooked to an inedible crisp? Well, as Goldilocks would say, it was just right. Warmed up with a little pot of lovely jam and putting to one side a couple of easily corrected minor technical faults, it was actually a good end to a really good breakfast. So as we come into land and I get another boiled rag, what are my thoughts on this 14 hour flight with British Airways in their business class club suite? Well, I've already said that I like the seat. I really do like this seat. Even though the colour scheme's a bit dour and grey, it can feel a bit like sitting in an office cubicle, but I do like these new style, simple business suites with a door for extra privacy. They really grow on me. The food was decent, with the Gravelax starter being the standout. The crew did a great job and worked hard, giving good service. And I found the club suite good for sleeping. I managed a solid few hours napping, which on a 14 hour overnight flight is important. So I'm giving British Airways and their club suite a big thumbs up. And now as promised, how I booked the ticket and how you can avoid making my mistake with the fees. I used my Barclays upgrade voucher, which allowed me to book into business class, but pay the Avios for premium economy. And the premium economy Avios was exactly half the usual business Avios because these were off peak dates. So I paid 100,000 Avios and 550 pounds in fees and taxes for the round trip. Uh, and using the voucher gave me the same Avios discount as if I'd been using my Amex two for one voucher. I promise I will make a video explaining the different credit cards, their costs and so on. But for right now, you can just just take my word for it. Or you can take a look at some videos about credit cards by my favourite YouTuber, Matt Jones over at Matt's Planet, and I'll leave a link in the description for you. So I paid £550 in fees and taxes, but there is a hack to reduce those fees that I didn't know about until I got back. And it's a herd on the grapevine kind of thing that I wouldn't usually share, but I have verified this to an extent. To show you this hack, the difference in fees and taxes on the route, the first thing I need to do is find some reward availability. And to do this, I'm going to use SeatSpy, which is an excellent tool. I recommend it because I use it and I subscribe to it and I'm on the premium plan for about £3 a month and that's good enough for me. There's an affiliate link in the description and if you subscribe after using that link, I get a few free months added on to my subscription. That's all I'll get. And you can take a 14 day free trial if you want to just see if it's right for you. Over in SeatSpy, you can see that there isn't much availability for Heathrow to Hong Kong, but October has some off peak dates. So I'm going to use the 11th to the 23rd of October, 2025. And if I book a round trip using Avios for those dates, it's 200,000 Avios, 575 in fees and taxes. But the trick or the hack is to book these as two one-way fares. 
Heathrow to Hong Kong is 100,000 avios and 287 pounds, but the return trip from Hong Kong home again is the same avios, it's 100,000 avios, but the fees and taxes are 35 pounds 79. So if you're gonna just book a reward round trip from Heathrow to Hong Kong with BA using avios, then this is gonna save you over 250 pounds in fees and taxes. But I'm using a voucher, so this is actually gonna cost me 100,000 more avios than before. Now, I don't think that I can use a Barclays upgrade voucher to discount the Avios if it's on two bookings, but I do believe that you'll be able to use an Amex two for one voucher to halve the Avios and get the reduced fees. I have to tell you in advance though, I haven't done this myself and I usually only talk about things once I've done them and I'm sharing practical experience, but the process in theory is this. You book the outbound leg using your voucher and you get a 50% Avios discount. Then you make a separate booking for the return at the full Avios cost. Then you can call BA and apply the voucher and you'll get 50% of the Avios on that return leg back again. And this process is used by people who want to use a two for one voucher, but book really far in advance on popular routes. Uh, and they'd book the outbound leg 355 days in advance before the return leg has even been released by BA. So if you have first-hand experience of doing this, please pop something in the comments so everyone can learn from it. So you can save on fees, but it's a bit messy and it does come with some risks. If you book that outbound leg as a single, there's no guarantee that the return will still be there when you come to book it. You'll also need the full Avios to book the return and then you essentially have to claim some of those Avios back. And finally, if you do need to cancel, you get two lots of cancellation fees because it's two bookings. Remember, vouchers need to be applied when you book. They can't be applied retrospectively. And again, again, I'm going to say that I'm a student sharing things. I'm sharing something that I've learned. I'm not a guru who's all knowing. And in this case, I've learned about it and I have verified it somewhat, but I haven't ever done it. But I wanted to talk about it in this video because I wish that I'd known about it before I booked and I figured you might be glad to know about it too. So I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did perhaps you could give me a like and do consider subscribing, clicking the bell and then you'll get notifications when new videos are released. I've got a video about my experience on Scoot coming up very soon and if you'd like to see how these club suites compare to the new Qatar version of club suite then this should be the next video that you watch. And if you'd like to support the channel, then I do have a Patreon page over there. You'll find Patreon exclusive videos like how you can fly for seven hours in Emirates first class using just £350 and some points. Or for about £1,250, you can actually make it like a two stage cash booking. So thank you for watching and joining me on Grey Gap Year.